right, Jerry. Thought we'd take another little chunk out here. Now that you've drained that passage, best I warn you about something. I was running down a wounded rower one night's eve when I glimpsed something in that waterlogged cavern. Looked a bit like a sand spitter, only the size of a bloody ox. I reckon it's nesting down in those flooded depths somewhere. If you're going that way, then do us a favor. Spill the old shield crab's guts before it gets hungry and comes looking for us. Orb of stones is pretty handy for this build. And of course, move A necromancer. Just the one, was it? Guess the bastard got a bit lonely, decided to make himself some pets. Well, good to see you don't mind getting your hands good and filthy. Here, to mark a dirty job well done. I've traveled inland on the Emperor's Road via Prisoner's Gate. Had to skirt around Axiom Prison. That's the holdfast of Brutus the Warden. Bloody treacherous trip it was. Worth it? There's forest in land. Game, berries, fruit. More food than we can scrounge here. But most here wouldn't survive the journey. Would be a damn sight easier if we could pass through the prison. Tell you what. You carve us a path up the coast. Find us a way past or through Brutus. And you'll have more than a few lives owing to you. <clears throat> Rowers. Overgrown chickens with a murderous streak. If you're not careful, they'll talon your guts out and snap them up like big fat worms. That said, be sure to rifle through their nests if you get the chance. Rowers are like magpies, attracted to what shines. Farewell. Fate will find you. Roaming, rotting rowers, roosting right here in Rayclaws. Squawking, separating, spooks, stalking our sandy seashore. Blighted, bedeviled bird bones beaking about our business. What? Can't a man have even a little fun in this dismal place? <laughs> I like Bastol. One day we'll be strong enough to make our way inland. Build new lives on the carcass of a dead empire. It's why God sent us maggots here. Isn't it? So the god they mention is Innocence, the god of Theopolis and Oria, for what it's worth. If someone says god singular, that's generally what they mean. Mm-hmm. Don't tell Tarkley, but they're the foulest foul I've ever tasted. Still, exiles can't be choosers. Poor Nessa. She used to be so fancy. So that's handy. Um... As far as going inland, we never do get to see the actual, um, settlement move, unfortunately. Even in Act 6, where we do have a time skip. Um, but we do see quite a lot of exiles further inland as we go, so... I think it's implied that, uh, maybe we're opening things up. The cause and effect isn't quite as clear While there we live, as I would wish. we are blessed. Ooh, my encampment's open. We're not going there right now, though. So, we're back in the submerged passage, and real quick here, let's just give ourselves a couple more skill points. Get up to Arcanist's Dominion? I do not know what they're doing there. Hmm. Not sure what those uh, glowing little vials are in the skill tree now. I'll have to look it up at some point. But I'm happy with where we are right now. And I'm not upgrading armor and things very readily right now because honestly, the sockets are more important to me right now than uh, the armor stats. We'll be replacing things so often, I just want to get my skills leveled. So here we have our uh, brood princess. These are going to come up more later, but just to give you a good look, they've got kind of a uh, definite fish face along with the tentacles. They're just a bigger version of the brood child. 
but they seem to be a little more evolved than the unstable spawn that we saw back in the fetid pool. Definitely a fish face, kind of fishy fins with uh, tentacles down beneath that they move around on. A lot of them also have ice-related skills, so they're, they're a unholy chimeric abomination, you know, as you might expect. Meanwhile, the cursed spawn are basically similar, yeah, um, but without such a clearly fishy body. It's mostly teeth that are at the end of their uh, tentacly stalks. No beak as you would expect from an actual squid. And here's a good look at our lovely spitter friends. Once you blast the armor off of them, um, they just start doing ranged attacks like little jerk faces. Weird kind of crustacean. Not dependent on its exoskeleton. And we've got some more water elementals who are always loosely humanoid and seem to be carrying around some kind of crab claws or something that they hit you with. These, uh, this area, I'm probably not going to have too much to say about it. It does have some armed undead rather than, uh, undead who are clearly framed as farmers or other ordinary people which we do see in other places. So that suggests to me that probably my hypothesis is right and this was used as a route of retreat by the Sarnish army um, after the death of Marseilles Lion Eye, their general, whose his name gives Lion Eye's watch its name. It's a guard post. Um, but I would guess that since the Kadawi came in frickin' canoes, they probably just went around to the next patch of coast. Because I know there's a... Uh, we're basically just skirting along coast through this uh, act. We never really go inland. As you can tell, because Tarquin's very excited about the prospects of going inland. And uh, we will be going happily into the jungle and seeing plenty of other folks there, but... I think Tarkley's too attached to his mission of rescuing exiles that have just washed up on shore that he's unlikely to move unless the government of uh, Theopolis changes. And even if it does later on in the setting, which it, it does, um, because I'm a terrible murderous witch, uh, I'm not sure he's aware of that or... Otherwise, maybe he's just too attached to his current location and self-imposed duty, maybe out of uh, some sense of, uh, what do you call, guilt for his prior misdeeds, which I don't think we ever get details I need more mana. Um, he himself doesn't seem much inclined to move, although it's, it's pretty clearly stated that uh, walking around here in in character terms doesn't take all that long it's it's certainly a doable walk back and forth for an individual person and even going out for a day bringing food back on the next day probably pretty doable oh gosh sake well this is the wrong direction but you can see the next area we are again along the coast this is the ledge so we're a little higher up um, there's some lovely bird nests along here. But let's head back in because we need to hit the flooded depths and take care of that giant crab. I do like the water elementals. I like their rough mimicry of human form. I think it's pretty entertainingly done. There is... They do all pretty much take on one shape, and I kind of wish that there were more variation in the models to suggest that perhaps they were mimicking individual people that they had seen. But uh, as it stands, I think that from an in-character perspective, they might be mimicking the form of a goddess or other very influential figure. I think that's also pretty interesting. We don't have any data on who that might be but it does seem plausible. 
And here's the last little close-up of these cute little blue crabs. What good babies, what pointy claws. As we head on into the flooded depths. We actually had caves like this back near Madison too. It was quite pretty. Um, it was a common school trip in elementary school that you'd go see these caves. So we can see a little more evidence of human uh, movement, if not inhabitation, with these old bridges that give access to other parts of the caves. We also, are, we also can see standing water pouring from above, which we didn't see before, so probably this is where the water um, that was blocking off that passage is flooding down into. From an out of character perspective, I think that some of the locations in this first act are kind of a um, tribute to, homage to the first parts of Diablo 2, um, because they follow a loosely similar path going through an empty, um, desolate moor kind of area over to more of an agricultural field to more of a uh, underground watery passage. I could be wrong about that, but honestly it shaped the genre so thoroughly, I think it's fairly plausible. Um, there's these drifting eyes here. They are flying. They cause blindness, which caused me no end of conniptions when I first started playing. But they do seem to be generally in the same kind of squid-like vein as uh, many of the other monsters we're seeing down here. Not sure if this light effect is meant to be uh, magical or something hanging down from above, which is probably most likely. Um, I don't think that it's some kind of magical light, but I can't directly interact with it, and it's above the quote-unquote ceiling where we're at, so not sure. I should say also, I've got an item filter on here, so if you actually get around to playing things, you're going to be seeing a lot more stuff. Um, I just put up a filter because, honestly, when you're far deep into the- ooh, into the depths, there's just too many items to deal with all at once. They clutter up the screen. So apparently when we get too close to the water here, there's some kind of horrible coconut crab that attacks. Ooh. What a good baby. That's new. That's a new environmental hazard. And it, it's not quite the same as the Dweller of the Deep, which is the crab that Tarkley mentioned just now. As you can see it here, it's much smaller, it's not a coconut crab. Um, and I don't think that lovely coconut crab is ever described or defined, so I don't know what's up there. Pretty cool. Um, ah, and it's signaled by this bubbling in the water before you get too close. Close. So if you stand right there, yep, there's the coconut crab. Very nice. As a sidebar, no, it's not explained how I can turn horrible crabs and stuff into uh, zombies. I personally just assume that the witch is offering them up as some kind of uh, spiritual sacrifice, and the go zombies are functionally more like golems than literally raising the dead uh, to move for them, but, you know, we can just call that gameplay and story separation, too. This being said, um, it doesn't seem like the witch... Well, no, she does. She can raise things that are not humanoid. Uh, it's just that the zombies and skeletons are always humanoid. You can use the raise specter spell, which does raise literally whatever monster it is as that monster. Um, so I like to think that she's just making some kind of sacrifice to a dark spirit or something. And let's roll on back to the ledge. We're getting close to Axiom Prison now, and that's another 
Sarnish area um, from near the Sarnish Apocalypse period. Roughly contemporaneous, no, definitely contemporaneous with Lion Eyes Watch and the Kadui invasion because uh, some stuff happened in direct response to the Kadui invasion. I'll show you when we get a little closer there. But let's head on out. You can see lots of seagulls chilling out, alive, not murdered by cannibals. Always nice. And uh, we can see more grasses starting to appear since this area is a little bit higher above the um, salt of the ocean, especially further away from the coastal areas. We're seeing more growth going on. There's also clearly a well-trodden path along with an awful lot of bones, so I wonder if there was some environmental damage done long ago by all of the treading feet. Oh, so this is a new one. Um, in addition to the rattling bones, which are just skeletons, and not very obvious, these guys eat corpses and, uh, puke them. It's gross. But, uh, they have a pretty cool design, which is just a weird seagull head on a bipedal body, like a bird god decided to try and pretend to be human. There's a few variations of these guys, but I'm fond of them. And we can also see plenty of cannibals this far inland, so presumably they had another route other than that uh, flooded passage to get over this way. We also have ancient archers, uh, who I think yeah, definitely seem like old members of the Sarnish army, so this was probably the path of retreat, and then they made their way into the prison as a fortified position they thought they could hold, and uh, the Kadui forces were too powerful for them. Fate smiles with sharp teeth. And my witch is still being a menace. So yeah, those bows, um... Not really clear with this state of decay whether they're military bows, but they do seem to be composite recurve bows, which seems fancier than you would expect some random peasants to probably have. And they're of course also standardized, which in gameplay terms means, you know, they only have the one model. But in uh, story terms, we can say that it does suggest that they're all members of a standardized army that ended up dying defending their retreat. And I do like the horrible seagull friends. They're horrible seagull friends. It's like the revenge of the gulls that you've been uh, startling from their perches this whole time. And yeah, all of the cannibals have those bloody mouths and, uh, go commando, apparently. But, um, all bloody mouths all seem to have maybe ritually painted themselves in blood, not quite clear. Um. Yeah. Certainly looks plausible. Maybe they've been dyeing their clothes in blood, too, the rags that they have left. Not really clear, but they do seem to be kind of a blackish brown that would support that hypothesis, and it would honestly fit with them too. I think these models may have actually been updated relatively recently. Um, I think we can infer that this is not a place where the Kadui spent a lot of time though, because we're not seeing any of those seashore longhouses, any of the uh, spiral carvings into the stone. So, this was somewhere where people moved and people died, not where people stayed. And that, uh, rather goes along with all of the storms and madness that we're seeing in the last weathered carving as well, in the last bit of a storyline. And this, there's another bird nest here on the ground, which does suggest some interesting habits for these guys. Maybe they're just seagull nests. 
since they're the only birds we're seeing around. Um, nesting on the cliffs, too. But let's get a little bit more lore going. The earth of Rayclast rejects the dead. The black spirit of storm and dream now reaches into the ground and raises up our slain Imperial foes. It leads the fallen from their graves and drives them to fight us beyond the end, rotted tooth and jagged nail. Our own remembered have joined their cursed ranks. No longer may we give our beloved to the birds, messengers of spirit to the sky, conveyors of flesh to the earth. Calm has commanded us to destroy our remembered with axe and fire. Calm is the bravest of us, willing to bear the ire of the ancestors for the survival of his people. So that's some interesting cultural stuff. We've seen before that, uh, like how do we behave in culturally appropriate ways, which would be considered barbaric by the more Western-aligned Sarnish, uh, culture members, like honoring someone with their head on the meeting house or on the belt. Um, they have different funerary and uh, honor practices than we would expect from most folks. Sidebar, Kaduku, the false god that we're fighting right now, looks very much like one of those Kadui statues which has been painted possibly partially with blood um, and has gained a life of its own by being worshipped, which makes sense since it's called the false god, um, probably by the cannibals, and has started spewing lightning at people. Like a terrible travesty thing. Um, and this cart over here is also a predictable set piece, so they've, uh, managed to get several other exiles trapped and have been uh, wounding them and seemingly taking pieces off of them in order to eat them. Because, you know, cannibals. But the cart itself looks much better made than we'd expect from cannibals. I think it's fairly clearly implied that that's a old prison cart that's been repurposed. So anyway, about the cottery. Um, Kadawi are practicing sky burial, which is very interesting because I've heard of that as a Native American practice and a Tibetan practice, but I'm not sure whether the Maori did it. And the Kadawi are mostly using Maori um, cultural antecedents in gameplay terms, which makes sense because the game studio is located in New Zealand. Um, but pretty clearly, uh, the buried bodies that they're talking about are Sarnish. And that suggests that they didn't engage in cremation, which makes sense culturally, because cremation is itself very expensive. It requires a lot of fuel. Um, but it's interesting because it suggests that, um... This tendency for the dead to rise is not something new that the Kadui are experiencing because they've just come to Ray class from uh, Ngama Karui. Um, it's something that's new to the people of Ray class as well. So maybe this is where the apocalypse really starts going. Maybe uh, the mad experience of the experiments of the Sarnish. Uh, alchemical elite are starting to have their effects even at this point. Hard to put the timeline together, but that's a thing. You can also see a very Sarnish fortification at this gateway, in contrast with the Kadawi ones we've been seeing. It's all made of stone, it's brickwork, it's fairly rough, even if it uh, has decayed over time. You can tell that these bricks were never really rounded off or mortared properly, they've just kind of been piled. Um, which is probably why it's decayed so badly over time, honestly. It's not like it got blasted by something. And here we have Goatmen. They are, uh, loosely sapient. Um, I think they're implied to not be quite as smart as, a uh, humans, but definitely smart enough to have their own gods and their own culture and their own magic. Um, basically satyrs. They're, they're kind of jerks. 
Uh, and we also have Dread Wheels, which are a particularly interesting enemy that showed up relatively recently. They're uh, skeletonized uh, dudes who were prisoners at Axiom Prison and had been tortured by being broken upon a wheel. And they, in death, have fused with that wheel and uh, become huge weirdos, honestly, but it's an interesting enemy. We're also seeing a lot of swords buried in the earth, which is interesting because that that wouldn't happen on accident with the kind of soil that they're portraying. It's too dang rocky. Even if you shoved it down with some force, it would probably hit a rock and stop. So, uh, I think that's just there may be some magic going on there as well. Um, we're seeing more and more pretty clearly Sarnish longswords embedded in the dirt here as we continue onward. And here you can see some Goatman Shamans. These particular ones do fire spells. It seems like there's some tribal differences between them probably, because we do see other kinds of Goatmen later on. Oh, and here's the first shrine we've run into. So, uh, these are not specifically cannibal shrines. They they are fairly consistent, but it sure looks like a cannibal thing. It's some kind of, uh, maybe a goat man, maybe another, uh, larger mammal has been killed and dissected, probably for harspicy, uh, for divination by the setup and state of the internal organs, which is a very interesting thing for them to be doing, because Sarn itself does tend to uh, have some Roman antecedents going on, and that was a thing that the Romans would do any time that they were expecting a big battle. They would seek wisdom from the gods and omens. They were super superstitious about it, um, trying to figure out if they were going to win or not. So it's interesting that that's what these shrines seem to be set up as. Either they've been continuing to be used, or uh, for some reason the old marks of hierospacy in the Sarnish Empire are still as uh, grody as they were when fresh. Yeah, this area is the climb, and you can tell why, because we're basically heading uphill away from the coast right now. We're not going to stray very far through this whole act, we're just skirting along the coastway. But, um, the only markers of human inhabitation that I'm seeing, no Kadoi longhouses or anything, so this wasn't an encampment, just the markers of a very nasty battle that have, uh, left physical and mystical scars upon the landscape for the long term. And I think this is actually where Lai and I ended up falling, so this battle would have happened before the first weathered carving that we found that was on the uh, second level we encountered. Yeah, here's Lai and I's standard. This is where Lai and I ended up dying. And that cloth is in remarkably good shape for uh, having been left out for a couple hundred years. Which I think kind of supports the idea that because this was such a traumatic mystical scar, it's survived better than you would ordinarily expect because it's taken its toll mystically upon the landscape. And, uh, oh yeah, here's Iron Point the Forsaken. He's a consistent mini-boss, and I think the implication here is that this was the very last stand. They were trying, with this band of archers, to hold off the Kadui at this choke point um, for as long as they could while the army itself tried to escape into Axiom Prison, which is just ahead, and use that as a defensible strong point. We can also see all of the folks that have been broken upon wheels in their uh, original non-undead state, which is fairly gnarly. Most of them do have beards, which suggests to me at least that um, they might have been there for long enough, being 
fed and kept alive just to torture them further that they grew beards while they were tied up there. Although it could be that this was the last bit of execution and they'd just been imprisoned for periods. Or it could be that a lot of Sarnish people had beards, who knows. They're basically mummified in the sun out here, presumably assisted by the salt air. Because we're not very far from the coast. Oh, and there's a little non-enemy scorpion here. What a good baby. Most of these non-hostile little animals are also purchasable pet microtransactions, so you can have them run around with you, which is always fun. So, um, let's get the lore dump here before we move on. The black spirit infects living flesh and bone. The animals suffered first. Their bodies changed. Their eyes filled with a hatred of mankind that is beyond instinct. Now it is we who must bend and bow like saplings before the seaborn gale. The firstborn of the kingdom of Calm greeted us this day. The firstborn of the kingdom of Calm was buried this day. Even our children are not spared the Black Spirit's touch. What have we done to enrage Rayclast? We look to calm. Our king will lay the spirit of this land at peace. Yeah, if you're getting some ominous stuff about the adulation of calm, you are correct. This is not a happy story. Um, this being said, um, what I think they're saying is that the children that are born here and end up being stillborn or perhaps deformed, perhaps just uh, unable to survive. Also, sidebar, check out my lovely rusted coif, which I am wearing to totally clash with everything else, but uh, I think it seems... Yeah, I think you can see the death blow of the uh, original wearer having had their uh, throat split because the crown of the coif is far less rusty than uh, anything else here. Also, still love how non-sexualized the character models are. And as we're close to Lana's standard, you can see that these uh, traditionally styled long swords of a very European make, which are not quite, but nearly identical in a way that suggests that they, uh, if they weren't issued in a standard way, they were probably supplied by a kind of Roman-style equestrian class to a specific marker. Right up against Lionel's standard, you can see all of the funky holdout weapons that were not proper military things, like gladiuses and daggers and... They were just going no holds barred here at this point, but we don't see any Kadoe weaponry, which we very well might, because a lot of what they were using was uh, jade embedded in wood, so at a minimum the jade would survive, but honestly we're seeing a lot of surviving wood too from the uh, Sarnish invasion. And his standard says, there is no honor without sacrifice. So this was Lion Eye's last stand. And we end up piecing together a little bit more about him as uh, as we continue onward here. Basically, he was a, I think, tough but fair general of great personal bravery. And he, he did not survive all this. We know that from the very beginning. So, uh, continuing uphill... Uh, this is the fawn, another of those standardized bosses, uh, another goat man shaman, and he's just got a little more magical power than usual. Nothing too exciting right there, but um, this little cage here is where you normally find Navali. It's a bone cave, which is always guarded by the fawn. Um, looks like it might be made of whalebone, given this fin, these fins right beside. Um, and yeah, that looks like the beak. Maybe it's more of a plesiosaur than a, uh, a whale, but something along those general lines. And you can see that some of the new models also blow in the breeze when that's relevant, which is uh, 
a pretty good artistic touch. But, um, Navali regards it as a trick or game of her goddess, Hinakora, Mother of Death, that she's been trapped there. It's not really stated for how long, but honestly, she's a revenant. It's probably not that relevant to her. And, uh, we've got more of these desiccated mummies that are on the... that have been broken on the wheel. They're all very similar models. Um, I'm not seeing any that have things like tattoos or differentiations in clothing that would suggest a particular social class or station. We've also got cages hanging along the sides of a Axiom prison where people were suspended, presumably until they died. Um, these ones are fully skeletonized rather than the mummified corpses that we see upon the wheels and I'm uh, based on the body posture and things like that I actually wonder if they ended up dying because li or because the prison itself fell to the Kadui and there was no one there to pull them back up dark thought, not sure if it's accurate but Brutus is uh I'd rather Tendencies. burn than call such a place home. Yeah, I know, Witchy. Um, Brutus's tendencies as the warden of Axiom Prison were, uh, reasonably gnarly, as you can see right here in a helpful, uh, look, because these are definitely torture implements and maybe farm implements that have been repurposed as such. So, uh, I think I'll call it here for sanity's sake, although that ladder going upward that we cannot navigate is a pretty interesting little touch, and I'm not sure what that means. And I also find it pretty interesting that there's a lot of spiders here, a lot of broken grates. Something has been clearly wandering around in here with great glee, probably long after the human inhabitants were dead. I don't think we do see remnants of the Kadui invasion going through here either, so perhaps something worse happened to the uh, Sarnish refugees who were fleeing through here, or perhaps the Kadui just ended up flanking them by going around the other way. But anyway, before I get too darn excited, um, let's call it here and let's uh, pick up back up with pick back up with this a little later.